It's time to learn some more about intermolecular forces. Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug and welcome to another AP Chemistry video. Now in the previous videos, we learned about the types of intermolecular forces like London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and ionic forces. In this video, we're going to see the application of this. So how does temperature change as we add heat to a substance? Well, let's take a look at this graph here. This will actually help us to see what happens. So notice that on the x-axis we have the addition of heat over here, and on the y-axis this is the temperature. Now notice that as you add heat to a solid, its temperature is going to rise, which is probably what you expected it to do, ex expected it to do, and then it's going to get to the melting point. And notice that as it melts, the temperature actually doesn't change. Now this is a surprise to some new chemistry students because some students just have assumed that when you add heat or as a substance melts that it's getting warmer, but that's actually not happening. As a substance melts, we're still adding heat, but the temperature stays the same. Now once it's all melted, we add heat and then it keeps going up as a liquid, right? So it keeps increasing in temperature and then it gets to the boiling point. And then something similar happens. We keep adding heat, but once it's or as it's boiling, the temperature actually stays the same. It actually stays constant at that boiling point. Once it's all boiled away and the substance is completely a gas, we can add more heat and then that gas is going to increase in temperature. So this is a graph that we call a heating curve. Now we can do the opposite. We could have a cooling curve and start with a gas and watch its temperature go down and then have the uh, condensation. It's going to be constant and then the liquid temperature would go down Then you'd have uh, freezing. It would have a constant temperature and then it would continue dropping as a solid. So this is a heating curve. We could do basically just the uh, reverse of this for, for a cooling curve. Now, let's answer a few questions about what we see here. Which states of matter exist during the melting process? Well, as you can see here, as a substance is melting, we're going to have a mixture of solid and liquid. And that's probably what you already knew, right? Solid and liquid. Well, how about this question? Does the temperature of a substance change as it is boiled? Well, let's take a look at this. During the boiling process, is the temperature changing? And the answer is no. And this is actually, like I said earlier, a surprise to some uh, new chemistry students because that, that's kind of a misconception, isn't it? The temperature of a substance does not change as it's being boiled or melted or if it's going the other direction, if it's being condensed or being frozen. During a phase change, temperature should be constant. Now, when we talk about some of these other labels on here, we have the, the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. Basically, that is just the amount of energy that's required to, in the case of, in the case of heat of fusion, the amount of energy that's required to uh, melt, or I, I should say, could say that, that we could also go with freeze, you know, the same, that same thing, just a different direction, to freeze one uh, uh, mole of the substance. We could express it in joules per gram as well and say how much it takes to melt or to freeze one gram of that substance. And this is how we could apply that. So that's the heat of fusion there. Here is a question. So the heat of fusion, we sometimes call it the enthalpy of fusion for water, is 334 joules per gram. So notice it's expressed in grams in this case. How much heat or how much thermal energy would be required to melt a four pound block of ice that has a mass of 1,814 grams? So this is just a simple uh, conversion problem, basically. We just have to take the 1,814 grams and write it down. And our job here is to find out how many joules it's going to take to melt this. So at the end, we're going to have, uh, we're trying to convert to joules. So we're going to have to put grams on the bottom to make the grams cancel out. We're going to have to put joules on top because that's what we're converting to. And the heat of fusion is 334 joules per gram. So we'll put 
334 joules for every one gram. And we can cancel grams top and bottom. And essentially, we just have to multiply. And we have uh, the, an answer of about 606,000 joules. Or that's a pretty big number, so we could convert it to kilojoules and say it's about 606 kilojoules. And so that's how we can solve problems that are just heat of fusion. And the same process would work for uh, heat of vaporization. If we're trying to boil water, we would just use the same process there. Of course, the constant would be different. Now, let's talk about some other uh, factors that come into play when we're talking about boiling and evaporating, freezing things such as that. There's this uh, function called vapor pressure. Now, vapor pressure is the pressure that's exerted by vapor or gas back down on the liquid from which it evaporated. And so that means that if you have a beaker of water, we know that some of that water is evaporating at room temperature even, and at temperatures below or above that. And so some of that water is going to evaporate and it, you know, it's pushing back down on the liquid. If we have a closed container like a bottle or a jug, something like that, uh, you know, some of that water is going to evaporate, and we can actually measure the vapor pressure that's pushing back down on the liquid in that closed container. Now, we know that as you heat something up, it's going to evaporate more, isn't it? I think common sense and your own experience probably tells you that. So we can say, as a result, that as the temperature of something increases, guess what? The vapor pressure of a liquid is going to increase as well. And I guess we could say the other direction, right? As temperature decreases, the vapor pressure of the liquid is going to decrease as well. Now, what does this have to do with intermolecular forces that we've learned about in this series of videos? Well, if you have a liquid with weaker intermolecular forces, the molecules don't stick together as well, do they? So that means it's going to be easier for those molecules to float away, evaporate, and we're going to have higher vapor pressures. We'll have more evaporation and thus more vapor pressure. So weak intermolecular forces, higher vapor pressures. Guess what? The opposite would have to be true, wouldn't it? Stronger intermolecular forces means you're going to have lower vapor pressures. We'll, we'll see how this comes into our problems here shortly. Now here's another factor, or perhaps we could say another vocabulary word. If we have a liquid that has a high vapor pressure at room temperature, we say that that is a volatile liquid. That's just a vocabulary word that's used to describe those types of liquids. So we have these, these factors here. We have vapor pressure and how it relates to intermolecular forces and how it relates to the volatility of something. Now, let's take a look at a graph and see if we can make sense of all this. So here's a graph. This is what, what we sometimes call a vapor pressure graph or a vapor pressure diagram. And what we've done here is, is just graph the vapor pressure as a function of temperature for these four different substances. We have propanone, which is basically just acetone. We have ethanol, which is a type of alcohol. We have water. And then we have ethanoic acid, which most of us know is just acetic acid or um, that's what the vinegar is made out of. So let's answer some questions about this graph here. So the first question is a pretty simple one. This is just a straight read the graph question. Estimate the vapor pressure of ethanoic acid at 120 degrees Celsius. So here's the graph for ethanoic acid. We find 120 degrees, so that would be right around here. And we go up here to that line, and it seems to be that it's right on that junction there. So what is that? That seems to be about 110 or very close to 110 degrees. I'm sorry, 110 oh, kilopascals. So we're, we're trying to measure the pressure, aren't we? So 110 kilopascals there. Now, what about this question? At what pressure in kilopascals would water boil at 90 degrees Celsius? Now, it's interesting that this graph can also help us to predict boiling point. Uh, basically, the boiling point of a liquid is just the temperature at which its vapor pressure equals the surrounding air pressure or the surrounding atmospheric pressure. So if we're going to look at water at 90 degrees Celsius, we'll find 
90 degrees, so that's right around here it seems. So we go up to the, gr the, the curve for water, which is right here. Now what pressure is that going to be? So we can move over here, and it looks to be about 70 kilopascals, or very, very close to 70 kilopascals. And this is interesting because we can go up in elevation, perhaps on a mountain or to a more elevated city, or location, and we find that as you go up higher, you know, there, there's less air pushing down on you, so that means that the air pressure is lower. And as a result, at higher elevations, water, and other liquids too, boil at lower temperatures. So we can actually go to a city that has a lower pressure, a lower air pressure up in the mountains, and we can try this. We can actually find that water boils at a lower, um, at a lower pressure. And as a result, you know, sometimes if you're trying to cook, there are special recipes given for high elevation locations. If you have a like a, a like a box of cake mix, it will say this on the side for higher elevations above you know over a thousand meters, for example, over three thousand feet. They'll say you know use this different recipe instead to bake the cake. Now, how about this question? Which of these liquids is the most volatile? Remember, the definition of volatile is something that has the, the highest or a higher vapor pressure at normal room temperatures. So normal room temperatures would be what? Something like 20, 25 degrees Celsius. So somewhere in this neighborhood, well, guess what? Guess what? The one that's got the highest vapor pressure would be the propanone. We see that graph right here. So propanone is the most volatile. Now, which of these liquids has the weakest intermolecular forces? And guess what? If something has weaker intermolecular forces, it's going to have higher vapor pressure, isn't it? So which one is that? Once again, it looks like propanone has got the weakest intermolecular forces, the, the highest vapor pressure for pretty much any temperature that we have here. R remember, weaker intermolecular forces lead to uh, a higher vapor pressure. Now there are some other properties of liquids that you probably have learned about maybe in a first year chemistry class, but it is worth reviewing them. And if you haven't learned these yet, I do have some videos that are specifically about these. Surface tension. Surface tension is the tendency of a liquid to maintain a spherical shape. And as a result of that, we have liquids that have very strong surface tension like water, and they tend to form these droplets, spherical or almost spherical shapes. Uh, Surface tension uh, helps to explain why water forms these droplets, as you can see on the screen. It also helps to explain why water has this, well, almost this tension among the molecules at the liquid, or at the top of the liquid, rather. We can actually float things that maybe shouldn't be able to float on water. If we're very careful, we can get a paper clip to float on top of water. We can have a, uh, like a bug or an insect that can walk on water. Maybe its density is greater than that of water, but because of the very high tension between those molecules, the, the high, the strong intermolecular forces, when you have water there, and these things can happen. We also have capillary action, and that's the tendency of a liquid to rise up a narrow tube. And so here's a, a good example of that. I have a demonstration I've shown of this before, and maybe you've seen something like this. The narrower the tube, the better this works, as you can see in the example here. And this happens because water has a greater attraction to glass than it actually has to itself. So it tends to you know, stick to the sides of, of that container, the very narrow tube there, and that pulls the rest of that liquid up. And so that's a very effective uh, demonstration of capillary action. This works for other things too. Water in uh, plants, we see a little bit of that here. We know that there are some other forces in effect as well, but capillary action plays a, a part there, where we can take some colored water and put some stalks of celery and see how capillary action allows us to rise. Capillary action helps explain why we can dry off with a towel. You know, the water is absorbed by that towel. Well, that's capillary action. So these are some of the important properties of liquids that you need to know about. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you learned something from my video, if you'd be so kind as to hit that thumbs up button, 
Uh, I'd really appreciate it. That way YouTube will recommend my chemistry videos to other students. Uh, like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for a long time. I want you to get a 5 on your AP exam and make an A in your chemistry class. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more, where we can learn some more chemistry together.